Good morning. We want to be in prayer for the Burner family. Charlie Burner passed away yesterday, and so uh, let's just pray together right now for that family. Father, we thank you for today, and we do pray for the Burner family, God, that uh, you be close to them, and Lord, we're reminded once again how short our lives are and how we should be living for the eternal. I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, this morning to number our days and know that uh, there is a time when we, too, will pass from this life to the next. I pray, Father, that uh, during these moments together as we open up to John 16, that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. I pray that your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds and our hearts that this sacred word would come rushing into our minds and hearts and that we would be changed and transformed as we look at your word. Thank you for the privilege of being here. We take nothing for granted. We know that our health is from you. Our minds, sound minds, Lord, come from you. An open heart comes from you. Your grace comes from you. Blessings of family and friends, these are from you. Our homes, our bank accounts are from you. Our cars, this church is from you. It's all from you. You are a good God, and you give good gifts to your children. I pray that we'd be grateful this morning, that we'd have open hearts, open minds, and that you would teach us through your Holy Spirit. I pray these things in your name. Amen. We're in a series called The Holy Spirit. We're looking at the ministry of the Holy Spirit today, so I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 16, and we'll look at this passage together. It's John 14, 15, and 16 are awesome passages about the Holy Spirit. They're also very deeply Trinitarian. If you want to understand the Trinity, you need to study John 14. And now John 16, and the Trinity is everywhere. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, and three persons. That's what we believe. That's what the scriptures teach. One God, three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this wonderful doctrine that's far beyond us to completely understand is found even in this text this morning. So today we're going to look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world. If you'll get your sermon notes out, that'd be great. It's very helpful to sometimes follow along the flow of the text. And the first thing we can see about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world, now this is interesting, folks. Listen to me. There is no other text in all of Scripture that talks about what the Holy Spirit's relationship is to the world. And we're going to find out how God, through the Son, through the death of Christ, brings the gospel through the Holy Spirit to the world. And so he talks about that. Jesus does. And so the Holy Spirit, first of all, we see, convicts the world of sin. John chapter 16, verse 7 says, But I tell you the truth. Jesus, once again, is, wants to get the disciples' attention. He is about ready to die, and he'll be arrested that night. The next day, he'll die on a cross. These are some of the last words of Jesus. He has so much to tell his disciples. He wants his disciples to know this. He wants you to know this. He wants you to be convinced of what he is about to say because it's so important. He says, get your attention, folks. This is eternal. This is what I want you to know, but I tell you the truth. This is the truth. He says, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. What? How can the going away of Jesus be for my good? 
I want you here, Jesus. That's what his disciples are thinking. I want you here. I want to go and I want to reign and rule with you in your kingdom. I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to throw the Romans out. I want you to set up this political system that you promised in the Old Testament. I don't want you to leave. But Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I go away. What does he mean? He means it's the best thing that could happen for them, to them is that he goes, he dies for their sins because they're sinners and they know it and they're not righteous and they're going to be under the judgment of God that he dies for their sin, he's buried, he's raised on the third day to show that God accepted his sacrifice for all mankind. The debt has been paid. He then ascends on high. He goes to the Father. He speaks to his Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Father and God the Son. Send the Holy Spirit to take the place of Jesus. That's why it's so good. He goes on and says, unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And so he says, I'm going to go. I'm going to pay for your sins so that the Spirit of God can dwell within you. Unlike the Old Testament, he's not going to be outside of you. He's going to be in you. He's going to live within you. He's going to make his residence in your body. In your body. And I'm going, and we have the beautiful trinity here. Amen? The Son dies for us, goes to the Father, and says, Father, I need you to send your Spirit so these folks have hope and have transformation and have a changed life and get them ready for the day when I'll take them home to be with me forever and ever. The Father says, okay, I will send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, according to the Nicene Creed, which is awesome. It's Trinitarian. We are Trinitarians. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son and goes into our lives. And that's why it's good that Jesus leaves because something greater is going to happen and that's the Holy Spirit. If I were to ask you, would you rather have the Spirit-filled life or would you rather have Jesus next to you? Which one would you choose? Which one would Jesus choose for you? He would say, it's better to have the Holy Spirit in you than the Son outside of you. It's better. Do you believe that? We live in a better age than the disciples. We live in the age of the Holy Spirit. If you want to think of it this way, the Old Testament is the age of the Father. The New Testament is the age of the Son. And the modern present age is the age of the Spirit. And so he the Spirit proceeds, comes from the Father and the Son, and He sends them. And the Counselor, this one that is, uh, this one that uh, uh, is comes alongside of us, which I think is better translated, Helper, the one who helps us, the one who dwells within us. He comes because Jesus went to the Father. And then he goes in and he shows what's going to happen when the Spirit of God comes. When he comes. When did the Spirit come, I ask you? When did the Spirit come? When he comes? When, when, when was that? Pentecost. When he comes. And what happened at Pentecost? The Spirit of God came and what's the first thing they did? They spoke in tongues and languages. And they went out and proclaimed the praises of God, and then Peter preached, right? And the Spirit of God fell upon, what was it, 3,000? 
The Spirit of God fell upon 3,000. We see how the Spirit of God was working in the world. The Spirit of God came upon them. They were converted, and the church began with them. And so the Spirit of God was released, which was a good thing, right? Because now the, the, the kingdom could, could span the globe, could span the world. And so when he comes at Pentecost, when he did come, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. And so we, found, we saw that this word paraclete means to come alongside and to defend or be an advocate for us so that when Satan accuses us and says, you are a sinner, the Spirit of God comes and defends us and says, no, look at Jesus. Jesus paid the price for, for, this, for this daughter and son of God. And so he's a defender. Don't you want the Spirit of God to defend you? But here, he's a prosecutor. There's two ministries of the Spirit of God. One is to defend us. The other is to prosecute the world. Those that don't know the law. A prosecutor, as a prosecutor, he comes alongside and he builds a case against the unbelieving world. This is his ministry. Convicts means exactly what it says. The Spirit of God convicts the world of sin. He prosecutes. He lays the claim. He shows them their sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. And so the Spirit of God is ministry. You can't have the gospel without sin, my friends. They asked Francis Schaeffer, a great apologist and theologian, philosophy of yesterday, and they said, if you had an hour to spend with an unbeliever, what would you do? And he says, I'd spend 45 minutes on the fall of man and sin that came in, the unrighteousness that it was a consequence of it, the judgment that is coming. I'd spend 45 minutes on that, and then I'd spend the rest of the time, 15 minutes, on the gospel of Christ, that Christ came for the world. And so we're missing some of this, because we don't believe in sin anymore. Oh, I make a mistake, we say. I failed. I didn't do it right. All true. But how many people say before God, I have sinned. And I'm so sorry. That's the work of the Spirit. No one can convince, especially modern man, where we're headed as a culture, as a society, and our way we think. It is going so fast down the tracks of relativism. It's going so fast down the tracks that there is no truth. Everything's up for grabs. We are in a whole new age, and we need the age of the Spirit to come again where the Spirit convicts the world of sin. Because we don't believe it. It's the work of the Spirit. Then he goes on and says something interesting. He said, because men do not believe in me. The Spirit of God is going to convict the world of sin generally, but he's really going to convict them that they have rejected Christ. That is the greatest sin of all because that sin will keep you out of heaven. It's a serious thing. Not to believe in Jesus. If I were to go downtown and do interviews with people on the street and say, do you think not believing in Jesus is a sin? They say, well, that's not a sin. You have a right to believe whatever you want. How can that be a sin? Jesus says here that to reject God in the Old Testament, to reject the Father in the Old Testament was a serious thing. To reject the Spirit of God who's convicting them about Jesus is a very serious matter. And so the Spirit of God, it's re, the Spirit of God's relationship to the world is one of conviction. That sin, and especially the rejection of Christ as Savior of the world, you're in big trouble. Secondly, 
The Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. Look what he says in verse 10. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. You know, I've read this so many times I've never understood it. I hate to admit that. Can I admit that to you? I wasn't sure what it meant until I really studied it this week. And it's got some deep meanings here. What is Jesus saying? He's saying the Spirit of God, God comes and, and, and convicts the world in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. The Bible teaches us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Our very best game, our very best day falls far short of what God wants. Righteousness is a way of life. It's what we do with what's been revealed. It's how we live our lives out. And so the, the, the Holy Spirit, who glorifies Jesus, by the way, the Holy Spirit works in a person's life so that they see that their righteousness is like filthy rights. You've got to be there. If you're not there, the gospel means nothing to you. It'll be a joke. It'll be a fat passing fade in your life until you come to grapple with who you really are. Not who you think you are. Not who people tell you are. But who you really are. That you are unrighteous person. But the Spirit of God goes on and t talks to us and leads us into these wonderful truths of Scripture and tells us, but Jesus is our righteousness. And so that's why he says the, the Spirit of God convicts the world of righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you'll see me no more. And when I go to the Father, I'm going to come before the Father and my righteousness is going to be your righteousness. And so the Holy Spirit talks to you about this and says you are righteous in Christ. Christ's righteousness is imputed to you. It's given to you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives that to you. But first you have to be convinced that your righteousness is like filthy rags and it doesn't do anything before the Father. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment, and in regard to judgment, the Spirit of God convicts you in regard to the world in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that it's sort of a progression. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't have his righteousness, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have sin. You're going to live an unrighteous life because sin produces unrighteousness, a way of life. Your way of life is not going to be what God wants. And then that's going to lead to judgment. And oh, by the way, you think you're going to get out of judgment? So Jesus is saying, oh, by the way, you think it's not going to happen to you? Somehow it's just going to pass by and he'll say, Jesus will say, God will say, you know, boys will be boys and girls will be girls and so the world is and everything's fine. It ain't going to happen that way. And this is why Jesus talks about this, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to show you that the prince of darkness, Satan himself, has already been judged. And if Satan's been judged and he can't get out of the judgment of God, neither will you. It ain't going to happen. Satan thought he won. When Jesus was on the cross, Satan thought God is dead. Jesus is the Son. He knows his theology. God's gone. God's dead. I am now God. I can now rule the world. I can now bring men into greater sin and greater wickedness and greater violence and greater pain. I can take the world. Until the third day happened, right? What happened on the third day? Jesus what? Arose 
And Satan at that very moment was condemned, judged. Jesus says, you won't touch my people. And Satan was judged and will be judged. And the Spirit of God speaks to the unsaved world about these realities. This is real conversion, my friends. <laughs> you go through this. This is the Holy Spirit's gospel. You go through this, and you're genuinely saved. When you realize your sin, your unrighteousness, and judgment, and your only hope is Jesus, let me tell you, you'll go running to Christ. You will just give your whole life to Jesus. He will mean everything to you. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we have the ministry of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit in the world. Let's look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the apostles, disciples, and, and, and in some sense to us in uh, the rest of this chapter. He says, uh, I have, he says, verse 12, he says, I have uh, much more to say uh, to you, uh, more than you can uh, now bear. And so the Holy Spirit will reveal more to the apostles. He's saying, I have so much more I want to say to you. You can't handle it now. You can't bear it. You don't understand it. But at a later date, I'm going to tell you. When did Jesus talk to these apostles about the more? That he had more for them. Did it ever happen? And when did it happen? And how did it happen? I believe it did happen. I believe that's what the Holy Spirit did. He, he, he brought more revelation to the apostles and they wrote it down. And that is our New Testament. They went on, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. The word breathed means spirit. God-inspired, God's spirit. All scripture is written by God's spirit. And so he had more to say to the apostles. And we believe in the apostolic church. Amen? They have the authority. They wrote it down. And it's without error. It's the truth. And he's saying to these apostles, I'm going to talk to you later. I'm going to reveal more to you later. And you'll write it down. For 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. The word of God does not come from the mind of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by what? By the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God had more revelation, and that revelation is what we have in our hands called the New Testament. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. But when he, which shows he's a person, not it, but when it, you know, no, but when he, and, G, and in the Greek you can see this very clearly, but when he, he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you apostles into all truth. And, of course, that is exactly what happened. They didn't understand it that night. They, they were still confused. But after the resurrection, after the ascension of Christ, after Christ sent the Holy Spirit to them, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they were guided into all truth. And we have that truth. It's in this book. Now, secondarily, it's written to us, too. He will guide us into all truth. But what truth is that? That truth is in this book. Where else would it be? Where else would it be? What, what, the Spirit of God guides us. Let me say this to you. In my opinion, uh, for me anyway, the Spirit of God speaks most clearly to me 
when I'm in this book. Because I believe that this book was written by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God uses this book to speak to me. He will guide you in all truth. The Spirit of God will speak of what he, of only what he hears. Verse 13b, he says, He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So the Spirit of God is going to come, and he's not going to make it up. It's, it's not like the Trinity. He's not in, 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 in harmony. The Trinity is in harmony. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They have the same message. They have the same words. They have the same purpose. They have the same uh, uh, thoughts, plans, dreams, Spirit, Son, Father. He's not going to come. And he's not going to lead you in a whole other direction my friends, the Spirit of God is Christocentric. Always. If you want to know if something is from the Spirit of God, you ask yourself, is whatever I'm seeing or whatever I'm experiencing, is it pointed toward Jesus? And he says, goes on, he says, and he will tell you what is yet to come. And he's going to tell you more. There's more to come. And that's what I'm trying to show you here. This is to the apostles. There's more. And, and, they were, and, and the apostles and disciples whom God had chosen wrote these things down. And we have them in our possession today. Isn't that awesome? This more we have here. The more revelation. We don't have to go searching for it. I don't need any more revelation. I've got enough. And it's in this New Testament. And he goes on and he talks about the Holy Spirit uh, will glorify Christ, will glorify Jesus. It says, he will bring glory to me. The purpose of the Spirit is to bring glory to Christ. It's to bring praise to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The Spirit wants Christ to to be exalted, to be honored, to be looked at, to be applauded. Not you, not me, not some whatever. It's Jesus. You want to know something's done by the Holy Spirit? Then look at where Christ is. He will glorify me. That's the purpose of the Spirit. It's not about the Spirit, it's about Christ by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And so he's going to take what's, what the Father has given the Son and he's going to give, the Spirit's going to make it known to you. And he wrote that down. This is the New Testament. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. And here you have the Trinity again. The Father gives to the Son all that's his. The Son gives to the Spirit all that's his, the Spirit gives to the apostles. The apostles write it down, and we have it today. It's called the Bible. It's the Scriptures. Now, I believe that God will guide us into this. He will guide us into all this truth. If we'll let him. Spirit's ministry in the world is to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit's ministry in our lives is to bring us to the Word of God. I would say this to you. There's two times in my life when I know the Spirit of God is working in my life. I know for sure and that's when I share my faith. The Spirit of God wants to do that. When I help people understand the gospel of Christ, when I ask them if they've ever given their hearts to Jesus, the Spirit of God's convicting them of sin and righteousness and judgment. You just know that this is of God. This is of the Spirit. The other time that I know the work and ministry of the Spirit in my life 
is when I'm in this book. I know. I can plant myself on it. Now, I believe the Spirit, we're going to get into other things. I believe the Spirit of God leads and guides us and uses other things. But I'm not sure about all that sometimes. But I am sure about this book. I'm absolutely convinced this is the truth of God. This is God's word to us. And the Spirit of God wants to use it in your life. The Holy Spirit has two ministries. The building up of the believers through the word of God and bringing the world to the end of itself so there's only Christ who's left. And my prayer is that those ministries would be used in our congregation, that we would be a congregation that's word-centered and mission-minded, that we're both. We're word-centered. We want the word to change us. We are challenged by it. It is, it is a challenge to keep in this book, keep reading, keep learning, and also to know that God loves the world. He loves the world. And he sent his spirit to bring the world to its knees so the world can find Christ. Let's pray. I would challenge you today to somehow find a way to get the word of God in your life. I don't know how. I know you might struggle with it. There's so much material out there today. There's so many ministries and programs where you can find ways of promise. You know, I, I, just, I just think that, I just think all of us should start our day with God. I think all of us should start our day in the word. And asking God to help us to understand and allowing that to be part of our lives. Allowing the Spirit to take that word and to convict us if we need convicted, to be challenged, to be encouraged, whatever God has for us. Lord, we, uh, we want to be carried along by the Spirit in your word. We want our minds to be illumined. We want to wrestle with it. We want to work with it. We want to focus on it. We want it to be part of our lives. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who does guide us into all truth. We thank you for the apostles who were obedient to you and wrote these things down over a period of time. They've been preserved for us. What an awesome privilege it is for us today. Thank you for the apostles' faithfulness. Most of them died a horrible deaths. They are faithful to you. And now we have their body of work. We thank you for that. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the lunch we're about to enjoy. Bless your name. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together.